Before we start this episode, I would like to pay my respects to Kevin Conroy. He passed away about two weeks ago, which is absolutely heartbreaking. I've said it several times, but he is the definitive voice of Batman, on top of being a kind soul who had unlimited talent and passion. Every time I watch anything with Batman, I will fondly remember the humanity and heart that he brought to the Dark Knight. Without a doubt, an absolute legend, and I truly hope he is happy wherever he is. How hot's the Majestic Magpies? Welcome to Vignettes and Vigilantes, a podcast about films in the DC animated universe. I'm your host, RK Muse, and today we're covering For the Man Who Has Everything, the second episode of Justice League Unlimited. It's Superman's super birthday, and Batman and Wonder Woman have flown on by with presents and the need to chill with their super buddy. Unfortunately, the last Kryptonian has been super hijacked by a super alien parasite, courtesy of Mongol, the former war world dictator. But without any further ado, let's nosedive into it. Flying along in the invisible jet, Wonder Woman takes a deep dip dive into the frigid waters. Batman remarks Wonder Woman's flying a bit recklessly, but Wonder Woman takes his criticism as a deep-seated fear, quipping, sorry if I scared you. Batman looks briefly at her as if to say, God damn it, Diana, I am not scared, but realizes that he would probably be without a solid comeback. I love you, Bats, but Wonder Woman verbally whooped your ass. Walking into the surely chilly Fortress of Solitude, Wonder Woman is carrying a nicely and neatly wrapped present in her hands, not unlike Greg Fokker at the beginning of Meet the Parents. The Amazonian princess asks the Caped Crusader what he purchased for his super friend. Batman pulls out a white envelope and Wonder Woman, exasperated, says, Bruce, you didn't give him a gift certificate. Batman defensively says, no, and then adds dourly, cash. What else can you get for the man who has everything? But in Batman's defense, a cash gift would be the most generous present in the history of the world. Still, great back and forth between Kevin Conroy and Susan Eisenberg. They've got great chemistry. The two heroes find their super birthday boy standing erect, it's okay to laugh at that, in the middle of the entryway. He is staring off into space with a grimace of fear, a black and purple alien creature wrapped around his chest. Batman immediately goes to investigate and determines the creature is a plant, growing through Superman's costume and into his body. Like many good parasites, but not the Rudy Jones kind. Wonder Woman volunteers to search for the person who surely breached the fortress. Batman begins narrating Superman's symptoms as though he were Dana Scully in an autopsy. Then we flash to Superman's dreamland. A small brainiac robot is waking Kal-El, but with friendliness rather than absolute misanthropic hatred. He wishes the hero a happy birthday, and Kal-El asks him to activate the windows, revealing a very rural-looking Kansan field on Krypton. Kal-El's wife, Loana, wakes, and she looks like Lana Lang, but she also looks and sounds like Lois Lane. Nice to hear Dana Delaney again. Kal-El and Loana begin teasing each other in a cute marital fashion when there is a sudden earthquake. However, only Kal-El appears to notice and make note of it. Loana pulls him in for some early morning kissing and Brainiac reminds Kal-El that he and his son, Van-El, are due for an appointment with Jor-El in the city later that day. Now we're back at the Fortress of Solitude, where Batman determines the plant was a gift. A mean, sinister, and parasitic gift, of course. And then we hear Eric Roberts' voice for the second time during this podcast season. It's revealed that Mongol, holding Wonder Woman's unconscious body in his massive hand, was the one who gave Superman the horrific plant, which is known as the Black Mercy. Batman hasn't met Mongol before today, but he was aware of the events of War World. Superheroes do like to talk to each other, you know? Mongol gloats over being able to disarm Wonder Woman and she springs up and kicks the shit out of him. Good diversion. Batman stands between the two of them and Mongol says that the males of their species are smarter. Okay, dude. He then says the Black Mercy is a telepathic species that reads off of one's deepest desires and creates a realistic simulation which allows the plant to feast upon it. When Mongol implies Superman would be happier as a despot, Wonder Woman attacks him but is injured. Mongol must be built like concrete because the Amazonian has some bruised and injured hands when normally she'd be fit as a fiddle, or limber as a liar if we're factoring in the Greek side of her. We then cut back to Krypton, where Kal-El is making breakfast and calling for his and Loana's son, Van-El. Kal-El slips in some doggy waste, but he tells Brainiac not to do the robotic thing, which would mean cleaning it up. Van-El then sneaks downstairs, with Crypto flanking him nervously. Kal-El scolds Van for not cleaning up after the dog. The older Kryptonian then tells his son they have to live up to their responsibilities, and Van volunteers his tribute to clean the mess. He then asks if his father will appear at the party, which was a big mistake. Loana tries to make a fib, and an exasperated Kal-El tells her he did not want a surprise party. She tells him it's just a small one. The two go to kiss, and we are back at the Fortress of Solitude. Mongol and Wonder Woman are having it out, with Batman joining in, but since he's immortal, he gets swatted aside fairly easily. Wonder Woman body slams Mongol, but it's clearly taken a lot out of her, and a lot of her hair strands out of her tiara. Mongol swats her around while an injured Batman struggles to rise. He goes back to a stunned Superman and begins lasering off the Black Mercy, but this doesn't do anything. It instantly heals itself, meaning that it would have a lot in common with Wolverine. 
Batman tells Superman to fight it and then help him and Wonder Woman defeat Mongol, but all we get is lifeless staring from Superman. Wonder Woman is launched through a wall. She whips out a fancy pants gat to defend herself, which Mongol finds quite humorous. She aims it at him and Mongol makes another sexist remark, which leads to Wonder Woman telling him to go to, then she pulls the trigger. We can't say the H-E double hockey sticks weren't in Justice League Unlimited, even though I'm sure the writers would have included this line in a heartbeat. Mongol uses Wonder Woman's own deflecting pose against her, and by that, ri I mean wrists crossed to divert the blasts, and begins making mincemeat out of our favorite Amazonian princess. A frustrated Batman realizes nothing is working and then notices Wonder Woman is buying them some time. He says to Superman that Wonder Woman is fighting for her life. He implores Superman to do the same and continue to fight the Black Mercy's hold. Now back in Dreamland, Cal and Van L go downtown. Van marvels over his father giving up a life in the city for a life on a farm. Turns out no matter if he's Superman, Clark Kent, or Cal el he was always one for amber waves. There is another tremor which, again, only kal -El seems to notice and register. An excited Van sees jor -El and runs over to him, giving him a hug. kal -El receives a ping from Brainiac, who reports the tremor is very minor. kal -El seems unconvinced. Wonder Woman is continuing to blast Mongol, but he's unharmed. He grabs her throat and begins strangling her. He then smashes her through the floor, saying that first he'll kill her and Batman, then Superman. He grabs Wonder Woman's head and smashes her through the floor again. Then, like Art the Clown, he begins stomping her face. Luckily, Wonder Woman does not resemble a destroyed watermelon. As Van marvels over the science at his disposal, he sees a Black Mercy, which causes his father to clutch his heart. Kal-El tells Jor-El about the series of mild tremors, with or without Kevin Bacon. Kal-El says that something bad is going to happen. Jor-El reminisces about the events of the last son of Krypton. In this timeline, Jor-El was wrong about the immediate end of Krypton, which came from the myriad tremors, and his reputation was destroyed. It ended up taking him years to rebuild his legitimate reputation, and it's clear he does not want his son to be humiliated in the same way. Kal-El stops himself from elaborating when his curious son joins them. Van wants to go to the roof and Jor-El tells him to go with Kal-El since he has other things to do at the moment. I'm sure it has nothing to do with reflecting on his life before the tremors began in earnest. Kal-El walks off behind his son, realizing the tremors are still there and recognizing something is horribly wrong. We're back in the Fortress of Solitude. As Superman's super pupils turn to normal sizes, having been more dilated than Tony Montana and Elvira Hancock's after a wild and crazy night in Miami, Batman is able to gradually pull off the Black Mercy, telling his friend to fight it. Now on the rooftop back in Dreamland, a bigger tremor begins, and this is when our hearts break. Superman tells Van how his birth was the happiest day of his life. Kal-El then reveals he doesn't think anything about this land is real, and Van says he's scared. Kal-El says he doesn't want to scare his son and makes it clear Van was everything he ever wanted in a child. And the life on Krypton is everything Kal-El ever wanted, but he has responsibilities elsewhere. The two hug as Krypton is swallowed up in tremors, just like the last son of Krypton, with the same moving and heartbreaking music. Kal-El kisses his son on the forehead as he tells him he'll never forget him. Batman is then overtaken by the Black Mercy and begins having his own dream, leaving a Zorro picture with his parents, the Wayne family taking a dangerous detour down Park Row. Joe Chill, voiced frighteningly well by Kevin Conroy, holds the family at gunpoint, demanding Martha Wayne's pearl necklace. Thomas Wayne jumps into action, pummeling the mugger who is still wielding the gun. Bruce cheers on his father. Back in the Fortress of Solitude, Batman smiles sloppily. Superman, now realizing there's a fight going on, flies into a rampage headed for Mongol. Better late than never, I always say. Wonder Woman struggles to rise, horribly battered. Mongol prepares to bonk her over the head with a nasty-looking spear, but is interrupted by the arrival of the Man of Steel. The two crash through the fortress, and Superman wails on Mongol as though he were Captain Ahab. An anguished, livid, and heartbroken Superman demands to know if Mongol has any idea what he did to him. He really didn't need the third entry in the Human Centipede franchise, after all. Superman continues beating the tar out of Mongol, a well-deserved beating if I do say so myself, and overdue since the last time we saw Mongol was War World, and he definitely deserved a few extra beatings. Mongol says he fashioned a prison that Superman could never easily leave, which is seriously fucked up. Wonder Woman crawls her way to Batman as though she were Tess and Barbarian, while Mongol begins returning the punches to Superman. Wonder Woman sees Batman kneeling on the ground, immobile, and calls out to him. The fight between Superman and Mongol continues, and Mongol wishes him a happy birthday, giving him oblivion. A gift card or maybe a nice shirt would have been better. Superman, a super fan of the tramps, instead tells Mongol to burn baby burn as he sets his chest ablaze with his Disco Inferno heat vision. Wonder Woman continues limping and struggling her way over to Batman, now having to deal with the Black Mercy herself. She begins pulling it off because Wonder Woman is a fucking beast. 
Now we're back in Batman's dreamland in Gotham City with Wonder Woman screaming Bruce over and over again. Thomas continues to beat Joe Chill, but a final Bruce from Wonder Woman breaks the fantasy as Martha and Bruce look on in horror and realization as Joe Chill murders Thomas Wayne. The Black Mercy is yanked off of Batman and Wonder Woman rolls around wrestling with it, kind of like if the Black Mercy were a puppy, but a horrifyingly fucked up puppy. Superman is thrown back into the wall, and Mongol says Superman should have stayed in his fantasy. Superman pounds Mongol's face repeatedly, demanding to know if Mongol knows what the Kryptonian lost. He then focuses on a sculpture of Jor-El and Lara, which seems to remind him of his more humanist leanings. Seizing the opportunity, Mongol goes to smash Superman's head with a rock, his own face puffy and bruised. Wonder Woman and Batman then surprise him as Wonder Woman throws the Black Mercy onto Mongol. The three heroes stand over Mongol and Wonder Woman reveals her birthday gift for Superman, a new breed of rose named Krypton. It's crumpled, but Superman graciously accepts it. I'm sure he'd also accept the Jerusalem tulip and actually know a thing or two about it. As he looks up at the sculpture, Superman promises his birth parents he'll never forget his desire to do good and protect those who need protecting. Wonder Woman wonders what Mongol is seeing and Batman says, whatever it is, it's too good for him. Superman seems to quietly concur as we hear Mongol's fantasy, the imperiled and tortured screaming of a populace in the middle of what I assume to be dictatorial rule and genocide. Mongol, lost to the rest of the people in the DCAU's continuity, gives a sadistic smile, no longer a threat in, and enjoying his own created brand of horror. For what it's worth, it beats being eaten by the Snowden people of South Park. That's for damn sure. And that wraps up for the man who has everything. Let's move on to the personal review, shall we? To say this is one of the most faithful adaptations of a comic book is to say, I think Batman's got some emotional trauma. It plainly is one of the best adaptations of a comic book to TV entertainment. Alan Moore, who wrote the original for The Man Who Has Everything comic, allowed his name to be added to the credits, a rarity for him. Alan Moore was known for writing a variety of iconic comic stories, including The Killing Joke, V for Vendetta, and Watchman. It was unusual for him to allow his name to be tagged onto the credits, but he was so impressed with this adaptation of For the Man Who Has Everything that he did so without hesitation. I'm not surprised, though, that Moore ended up loving this episode so much. The DCAU is full of prizes and very few stinkers, in my opinion. This episode is heartbreaking, triumphant, horrifying, and told with perfect reverence and emotion. Though Jason Todd's Robin was cut from the story since the creative team, Bruce Tim in particular, did not care for the Robin character, it's still a great adaptation. I've got a soft spot for Robin, I always have, but Wonder Woman does get to kick some ass quite wonderfully. Batman, Wonder Woman, and Superman meeting up for a quaint little birthday celebration is comedy gold, and they don't have to worry about an impressionable teenager wandering around the Fortress of Solitude. No, I didn't intend to cover both of Mongol's appearances in one year, it just happened serendipitously. But I like how it worked out. Mongol is a handful. But that makes him an excellent villain. Mongol's presence here makes perfect sense to me. After Superman basically told the people to take back War World from Mongol, it's logical the buff dictator would hold a grudge. So he did that by trapping Superman in his biggest what if and wish memory, knowing Krypton intimately and having a family there. I also find it really cute that Superman's dream woman resembles both Lana Lang and Lois Lane, but has Lois's personality and voice down to a T. Superman, like Dick Grayson, might have a little thing for redheads, but there's no mistaking that he recognizes Lois Lane as a fox and somebody he wants as a partner. It's just the little details, honestly. And it's also cute that he imagines having Crypto again, if you remember that darling puppy from part one of The Last Son of Krypton. And it's sweet that his father's still alive and kicking and still voiced by Christopher McDonald. And it's nice that he has a son who loves him and wants to learn more about their society. Watching Superman's inner turmoil when he has to destroy the dreamlike state and effectively murder his child is quite the tearjerker. It's always an episode I remembered as a kid because of how sad it is. It was hard for me to watch it for the sad scenes, even though as a kid I always loved Wonder Woman kicking ass. Now that I've addressed Superman's dream world and why it's particularly super endearing, it's now time to address the bullet-filled elephant lying dead on Park Row, eventually colloquially renamed Crime Alley, Batman's fucking dream world. Dr. Thomas and Martha Wayne are walking down Park Row with their excitable son, Bruce, and are confronted by none other than the crusty-looking mugger, Joe Chill. Bruce's excitement quickly sours as the mugger descends on the rich family, wielding his gun and demanding Martha's string of pearls. Thomas, without hesitation, violently confronts the thug and they get into a match of kicking and punching. Bruce cheers on his father and he and his mother look relieved and happy, soon to be on their way back to Wayne Manor. But as Wonder Woman begins freeing Batman from the parasite, Bruce's face falls into horrible realization. It's obviously confirmed Martha will be next on the chopping block after Thomas is killed and Joe Chill will escape into the night, leaving behind a young boy who will never be the same. 
The fact that Batman could not imagine a happy world where he's a well-adjusted adult speaks volumes. He cannot imagine a perfect world where he's grown up because as an adult, he knows no happiness. All he can think of is rewriting history and an outcome in which his father bests Joe Chill. Batman is so wounded internally that he can't even think of a life with his parents in it beyond their murder. Bruce Wayne, the sprightly kid from the dream sequence, cannot think of a life where he's grown up with his parents in it. That just shows how damaged he is and why he eventually winds up alone. If you watch Batman Mask of the Phantasm frequently like I do, you know he feels guilty for being happy, as if his parents wanted him to mourn them his entire life. As a result, Bruce can't even imagine a happy life for himself. He doesn't allow himself to let other people in and comfort him. He comforts other people in his own unique way, but he doesn't really allow himself to be comforted. And that's reflected in his fantasy sequence. He can only see himself as truly happy right before his parents are murdered, the largest traumatic experience of his life. And though he does rely on Alfred Pennyworth as a father figure, it's clear that not even Alfred's support and encouragement have helped him heal. Batman is not only a symbol of positive vigilantism, he is an example of someone who has never let go and feels unworthy of happiness. Mongol's fantasy is one that should not exist. Nobody should be celebrating the torture and murder of innocent beings. Nobody. But it's strangely beautiful for Mongol. His fantasy is probably what he imagines he could do to War World, but who's counting? Mongol's ultimate fantasy is inflicting pain and suffering. He's just like the seldom expected Spanish Inquisition. So while Mongol is facing the ultimate punishment, having his body co-opted by a parasitic alien, he is in perfect bliss. He can imagine killing galaxies of beings until the parasite eventually kills him. It's not at all justice for what he did on War World, justice there would involve Draga eliminating him, but it's justice for what he did to Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. He beat the ever-loving shit out of Wonder Woman and threw several sexist remarks her way, he assaulted Superman and attached a parasite to his chest, and by proxy he did the same to Batman. And to both of these men, he sent them into a spiral of regret and depression, which comes with watching your planet explode and your parents being brutally gunned down in the middle of an alley. Mongol is at his most evil in both appearances, whether he's thunder-doming a society of people or screwing up the happiness of a do-gooder. It seems that he's found peace at the end of the episode, but I like to believe that the parasite slowly subtracts your nutrients and vital fluids as its form of consumption, meaning Mongol has a long, torturous death to look forward to, and we're lucky Batman and Wonder Woman threw Superman a surprise party and spared him from such a fate. Mongol's fate is absolutely justified to the point where it's the most fitting outcome for such an evil villain. The theme of regret and what-ifs is on full display here. Superman sees the life he's always dreamed of, knowing Krypton, having a relationship with his birth parents, and getting a family of his own with the woman of his dreams, the son he's always wanted, and the dog that he's pined for since birth. But upon realizing that this world is a farce, the toxic poison of a parasite, Superman has to turn his back on the life he's always dreamed of. He has to break this devastating news to his child and say goodbye, then be transported back to his flawed real life. A life where he doesn't have a close relationship with Jor-El or a deep loving marriage to Loana, or a child he even idolizes all on a planet he's always wanted to experience. Doing so sends Superman into a cathartic rage. Superman's rage is often directly correlated to sadists who abuse their power, like Darkseid, Mongol, and Lex Luthor. Superman beats Mongol within an inch of his life, and it's clear that he'd have the same reaction if the Kents, Lois, or anybody else in his life was harmed. And that brings me into a brief tangent about George Newbern's voice acting strengths as Superman. His early Superman was often criticized for being too weak or having dialogue that was just too corny. But once the second season of Justice League rolled around, Superman was able to unleash the beast inside him. George Newbern is a great Superman, and I think he is able to bring a certain unique anger to Superman. After the events of Superman the Animated Series, this character dealt with being perceived as a threat and dealt with the trauma of being brainwashed and tortured by a dictator. There is a lot of anger towards those who hurt him and a lot of self-loathing for being brainwashed. Superman is a tortured soul by the time Justice League begins and watching him react in such an angry, hate-fueled way is refreshing. Newburn's vocal performance is chilling and I think that's a part of Superman he does very well. He can portray those angry, devastated emotions while also being fatherly, optimistic, and upbeat. We see this with most of the Cadmus arc, Twilight, Hereafter, and other episodes of Justice League and Justice League Unlimited. On the Batman side of that coin, bringing us back to the analysis of the episode, Batman wishes that he could rewrite history and spare his parents. But when Joe Chill murders Thomas and Martha, all Batman can feel is regret. Regret that his father couldn't fight off Joe Chill. Regret that his mother was killed alongside his father. Regret that both of his parents were killed. And regret that he himself couldn't do anything to scare off the murderer. 
So when Batman is brought out of the Black Mercy's grasps, he's completely crushed. We don't really see it, but I like to imply that he feels a kind of impotent sadness. It's also outright implied in the DCAU that no matter what edition of Batman we have, no matter how many alternate realities or dimensions there are, he will always be the son of murdered parents, grinding away his entire life to hide the pain and suffering. And that regret is something every human being has experienced, passionately wishing that a life-altering event never existed and will never exist. But Batman's always been a hero grounded in reality, and he's always been a character who has to reconcile the crazy and magical shit that he encounters. He's going to have a realistic outlook, a realistic personality, and that is perfectly exemplified by his childhood trauma. Some kids brutally lose their parents, some kids lose their parents to an accident or a disease, and some kids face trauma that is comparable to Batman's but without their parents being affected. Batman is frequently seen at his most human throughout the course of the DCAU, but especially here. He wants to take a page out of Cher's book and turn back time, but you can't do that in the real world. Fantasies are called fantasies because they're imagined beauties rather than the harsh realities of life. Batman had no choice but to accept his parents were dead and never returning, and he had no choice but to move on from the assault of the Black Mercy. He had to retreat back to his dark, constantly depressed outlook because that's the only emotion that's always been there for him. Despite it being so crushing, it's almost like a warm blanket. Batman has lived his entire life since the age of eight, cloaked in sadness and regret, but there is nothing he can do about it. So it's back to the status quo and the happiness he felt of this fantasy was gone, but never forgotten. I now want to shout out the vocal performances of our principal characters. Susan Eisenberg is amazing as Wonder Woman, and she doesn't skip a beat in this episode. Wonder Woman's anger, devastation, and struggling to keep her head above water spoke to me on a primal level when I first saw this episode, and I think it's one of my favorite vocal performances in the entirety of the DCAU. Furthermore, as I already said, George Newbern is a great Superman for one reason in particular. He can portray Superman's trauma-influenced rage with perfection. When Superman realizes he was manipulated by Mongol, one feels fearful. Eric Roberts is sinister and creepy as ever as Mongol, which is exactly what the character needs to be. Frightening. And of course, I have to pay homage to the late, great Kevin Conroy. He's never out of step with Batman, be it as the straight man to the wackier characters or a person who is wrestling with intense feelings of depression and regret. But here, he has no choice but to deal with the emotional torture he'd been subjected to and has to move forward. That grim resignation is just another bullet on his impressive resume and only cements him as the definitive Batman. I've said it before and I will gladly say it again. Rest in peace, Mr. Conroy. You were loved and admired and I hope you're happy wherever you are. And that wraps up the synopsis and my personal review of For the Man Who Has Everything. I will see you very soon with some holiday content. You can find me on Instagram at r.k.musethewriter and on YouTube under the channel Vignettes and Vigilantes. If you don't know what to get your friend for his birthday, don't procure a Black Mercy. Just go with cash or a gift certificate, or a rose. All are better options than the Black Mercy. This has been RK Muse with Vignettes and Vigilantes, flying off with the other magpies.